Yeah. Those of you who have had me as a wits teacher in your classroom know I have no shortage of things to say about spoken word poems. And so, uh, before I even start, I have to say a couple of things. Um, my heart is bursting with emotion and pride tonight. What an incredible evening this is. And, um, you know, how could I have imagined uh, when I first walked into Nathan Hale the first day, you know, clutching a DVD with an Anis Mujgani performance on it, <laughs> um, preparing to define spoken word for a new generation, uh, that that little trickle would grow into this incredible river and these voices. Uh, one of the things, um, that I sometimes uh, become concerned with, not just for spoken word, but for any art form that we get involved with, is, you know, you see other people whose work you love, how do you allow yourself to be influenced and not emulate? Or how do you stay true to your own voice? And what I heard tonight from every person, every poet who's gotten up and read so far, is this incredible range, this variety of voices and subject matter and style that uh, gave me faith again in, in the, the wealth of unique voices in poetry. And it was great, yes. <laughs> After we broke up, we didn't speak for two months. When we saw each other again, he hugged me and whispered in my ear, Miss you, too stingy to include the eye. <laughs> Miss you, like he was a fragment in search of a pronoun. Miss you, like he was at a football game rooting for Mississippi State. Miss you, I have just won a beauty pageant in the state of myself. <laughs> so I push him away and say, that's Miss me to you. <laughs> no, I don't. He says miss you and my heart goes carousel and jackhammer because he misses me, or ostensibly he is the one missing me, at least someone or possibly something misses me, and it feels good. The way cold chicken tastes like steak when you're starving, I've been lonely a long time. So I ask myself, what is the least I would settle for? What if he just said miss and then looked at me pointedly? <laughs> what if he just pushed out the meh? And I scraped together all the forgotten letters until he missed me in three phantom syllables, the ghost of my desire to be longed for. After he leaves, I pull the words from my ear, fold them, and put them in my purse. I might be hungry later. <laughs> An unpaved road or a paved one, extra twisty. Slurpees with fat blue straws to stain their laughing teeth. A car that fits seven with new subwoofers and an iPod plug-in. Paper bag full of fries with three spots like sopping bruises. A wine bottle full of moonlight. Half-blind liquor store cashier. A friend working the 7-Eleven. A text from her. A radar detector. A car that fits eight. A new spot. Turn here. An empty basement. A text from him. Parents with a liquor cabinet. An old guy outside the ABC store. A day off school. A new song. A dope new song. A car with room for 12. Two pepperoni pizzas and a box of yesterday's donuts. An extension on the English paper. A postponed on the physics exam. A cornfield. A treehouse game of truth or dare, or never have I ever, a game of tag in the dark. Once, Chris and I went with Julie to her grandmother's house, who had died in the hospital just the day before. Julie had the keys and wanted to show us. We drove through the cornfields in the moonlight and got there at quarter to ten. Every surface of the house, doors and mirrors, kitchen cabinets, the front of the fridge, were covered in the feathers of sticky notes, green, orange, and red. They said, your daughter's name is Caroline. You have two sons, Jim and August. A doctor's appointment Wednesday. You lost your husband in 1983. 
After that, all they wanted for the night was their youth, their kind youth. I think there were a couple of little kids in the audience earlier, but I think they